individual committees will call themselves to order. We don't have Jared for Oh, no. It's standing else online. not here. She's in Boston. She's not in Boston. She's in Boston. Um, probably not from Okay. So, okay, so we don't have a Michael Merritt for the bill. Okay, so that one's going to see what Phil's excuses. Technically, each committee is going to vote on the transportation contract. So, they're going to call a special meeting to get everyone. So, Mr. Scott, I mean, the majority of things are used individually voting on tonight. It's just that we have to collectively do it together. So they're going to decide on a discussion and then we'll have a whole new quagmire if they decide to do something different. It doesn't, maybe that won't be the case, but we'll deal with that problem. Can Conway just do their own thing when they they're going to have to call a separate meeting for both of these objects? Okay. Um, so, Michael, there's a motion to approve the contract for the Oh, you're there. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't check you off. <laughs> <laughs> I just try to get all right. Yeah, let's make sure. And Henry is not. 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 And Bill Smith is on. <clears throat> okay, I'll start by like, uh, calling the Deerfield Elementary School committee to order at 624. Call the Frontier Regional School Committee to order at 624. Call Sunderland Elementary School Committee to order at 624. Call Waitley to order at 624 also. Um, first order of business is to review and approve the minutes from November 28, 2023, and January 23, 2024. Does anyone like to make a motion? So moved. Second. Second. I'm both of them. Yes. Uh, yeah, okay. okay. Can we the whole group? Yeah. Okay. All right. All in favor of approving the minutes from November 28th to January 3rd. And he's got a hand up. Can't see her. And Bill? And Bill doesn't have a camera with me. Okay. So, Bill, can you, uh, Bill, can you um, do vote to approve the minutes? Bill, wake up. <laughs> Sorry, I mean, <laughs> yes. Okay, thank you. Um, next up, we have public comment. Is there anyone who did not have a chance to speak who would like to speak? Okay, thank you. All right. Uh, next, we're uh, going to review the proposed school calendars for next year. Uh, we are in a slightly unusual position this year. Uh, there are two proposed calendars uh, for Frontier and 38. So we I talked with two dairies about this, and we wanted to discuss how we vote on this. Um, the two calendars are the version one and version two. You see them on the left here uh, page. The difference is a uh, shorter holiday break in version one, a longer break in version two, uh, and we will. Frontier will vote to approve the Frontier calendar. Union 38 will vote to approve the Union 38 calendar. I would like to suggest we do a standard vote. Frontier votes for theirs. Union 38 vote for reps. Vote for theirs. If there's no objection to that, we we'll should do that way. Do we have to make a motion on which one we're choosing? I think we're, yes. We're going to discuss it. We just wanted to make sure that everybody's clear about how we're voting on it. The two have to agree, bro. <laughs> <laughs> we have a bus contract. It's the first thing, and then also have shared set. You know, so you, if you have different ending dates, it's going to 
it's going to have a financial impact on this. So you want to try to agree. So we'll have a discussion. And in the past, it's kind of hasn't been an issue, but we never had two calendars before. Um, and it is a unique situation with the one bird holiday um, opportunity that some people want us to put forward. Is it? Does the administration want a short recess or a long recess? No, say no. I work here. I'll make a motion for the longer one then. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, so. Educating why why are there two? You know, you have to. What's the why? What's there to be short and long? Which is going to cost more? Uh, and tell me why. Um, right now, it has the uh, the basic the biggest difference between the two is is after the December holiday break and after New Year's, you can either come back on a Thursday for two days, or you're close enough where you could consider having two full weeks off. Um, you know, we heard from. Um, the association and took a vote and remember we have to run the calendar by the association if we want to start before the last Wednesday in August so it gives them an opportunity to give us feedback as well um, and they um, had a majority vote uh, asking for the two weeks and there has been discussion of whether or not um, just to kind of put it out there it seems kind of open and shut there but there has been discussion on the equity around that as not all families can afford um, to take that kind of holiday break um, and it would be an opportunity for some and not for others who recall, recall, rely on the school district for child care and support. Um, and it's also a long break for those those students who need additional support and have a break from services, as well as food and that kind of thing. So it's a, it's one of those things where it is a, it's more of a, again, let's remember it is a simple counter. We don't need to get too deep into it, but it is, um, you know, it does impact the community in different ways. To, I think you you said it's the school calendar. <laughs> so I'm just making sure I'm hearing that right. So uh, the reason we have two is to give these options, but the teachers association has asked them and they they asked two weeks. It's insurance. It's just a it's insurance. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, that's okay. There was um, so the there's two versions um, and the the association you mean the teachers association and they That's requested correct. that they, they association for oh, okay. okay and they would like they would like to do this but it might then the cost then be there's no there's, there's only cost if there's a difference between the two schedules so that's why we have to make sure all the communities are oh, talking no. to each other that the calendar needs to get sense if we um take a longer break you go two days longer and Okay. Um, and you can kind of see how that works out. That can also be add a couple of snow days. You go into the following week. You know that. Kind of okay. so, I think this can also be sort of um, this can also be tricky if Frontier ends up with a different calendar than the elementary schools. That's you can't have a different. You, you technically yeah, can, even but though somebody's we're voting separately, the cost of us contract we're going to have to agree there. in discussion before we vote. Right. Which one we go towards because this is going to be a hot mess. Right. Yeah. Exactly. It's, what we're looking at is the difference term. with weekends. It's a 12 day vacation versus a 16 day vacation. And that will affect a, like, because uh, other schools, do we know what other schools Other schools are having the same conversation okay. debate. They're kind of, there's a split. There's not a split even. More people are coming back rather than staying long, but some are going longer. Um, you know, I'll just throw out there to, to kind of break the ice. My recommendation is shorter. Um, those families with means can take the two days off from school, call the kid in sick. You know, we, they do it. They, I want to say they do it anyways because we're trying to battle um, tennis issues, but um, if they have an opportunity for a long distance vacation, we can, it's an opportunity that they can take and it doesn't affect those uh, work. For reference, I consulted our prior calendars and last time Christmas and New Year's fell on a Wednesday, we went with a shorter 12 day break. So um Sir Trevor, I just oh, had a no, number no, earlier. No, no. Uh, 
Yeah, and I mean, I wanted to say I share the concerns that Darius brought up about equity for students. You know, families need childcare, students need access to food, need access to special education services. Uh, I'm also concerned. So the union did vote a majority of them for the longer grade, but I've been approached by multiple some of the faculty saying that personally they feel like some of them kids really need a shorter grade. Um, as a teacher, I know that learning days in January are way more valuable than in June. Uh, it's an equity issue across the district. Sunderland is not an air conditioning in our classrooms. So uh, that decision impacts us at But we're working. <laughs> There's no rule in which all of them have an air conditioning. Yeah, sure. Trying to get an item. Trevor, just I favor. I would just say I favor the shorter one too, mainly to keep the kids, you know, that need support. So two weeks is a long time. Um, I just that's just my two cents. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I support the equity side of it. The families that get on the means are working, it's their hard unless they're going to offer uh, school time on that Thursday and Friday. Um, one question I have though was if, there, if it goes into June, the longer schedule would it be Thursday and Friday? So we pushed up regular weekend no matter what. There's no snow, maybe an absolutely long Monday, but the longer schedule would not Friday. Possible that the longer schedule ends on a Friday, but the shorter schedule ends on a Wednesday. Right. Yeah, that's a good Yeah. Thank you. You're going to have waste months. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm Sunderland also, and in talking to parents and teachers, it is across the board in favor of a shorter break, just from an equity standpoint, as well as the concern if we do have five snow days. How many students are actually showing up on that last Monday? Um, so the overall feeling from the that's what it's really been a shorter break. There you go. I was going to comment on the shorter uh, break as well. So look at the end date in June. We would also then be dealing with Juneteenth. If we had five snow days, I think this year we were very lucky when we had two, three. Last year we had six. Um, we went with a longer break, you know, kids would be getting out of school. Speaking of the sanity of the parents. Would you guys say shorter one or longer about parents? Is there some more insights to the teachers' association and why they made that reference? I mean, is, is there a overarching? I mean, some of the arguments there is it's a you know it's a you reset your building, you know it's flu season, longer time to reset that, you know it's a longer break. You, know, you, know, you can put this the other side is longer time with your family, longer time with their families and, and, and their children and such. So I mean, there's 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 always. There's always a good explanation for a longer vacation, you know. <laughs> I think, and, and, and sometimes, you know, there's, there's healthy ones there too. I would move to the, make a motion for a shorter break. Second. Um, if that's not a morning number, I would make the motion. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make a motion for a shorter break. I I'll second. second. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're actually taking it for you. Um, Okay, Joe, Joe's going to second it because he is Sorry. Um, okay, so uh, for union 38, I'm going to roll the hall of my list here. Uh, Elaine is not here. Michael. Uh, yeah, so I guess I'll just clarify that this is union 38 voting on the shorter calendar, not Frontier. Right here. Right. Yeah, just, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, I just want to clarify. We'll, we'll take this so I don't move to Frontier. Yeah. Just the union 38 reps? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so I start Deerfield, Mary Angel is against. Erica is not here. Danny? Yes. Uh, Jessica? Yes. Yes. Um, Joe? Yes. Amanda? Uh, Bob? Yes. Bethany? Yes. And Henry? Yes. Okay. Great. All right. All right. So we also need a motion. From Make a motion for Frontier for a shorter. All right. Oh, I do have my. Too late, Bill. Sorry. Sorry, Bill. Go ahead, Bill. 
Yep. Olivia? Yes. Chris? Yes. Bob? Yes. Joe? Yes. Keith? No. Mary? Yes. Damien? Yes. Jared? Yes. I'm a yes. All right. Thank you. Uh, the next one should be much quicker to get through. We're voting on the 2024-2025 uh, school committee meeting calendar, and there's only one option. So there's no discussion. I'd be looking for a motion to approve. Motion to approve. Get this all together. Uh, this one. You could do it all together. If you think it's going to be easy. All right. Olivia, second. All right. So. All in favor in the row. Uh, it, it is it's all the individual committees because it's your calendar, it's not calendar, the union 38 right. calendar, where the union 38 calendar is together. Okay. And then um So you got to roll call for the two on. So uh Danny, are you in favor of the uh school committee committee meeting schedule? I'm sorry. I'm voting yes. I'm voting the same way, right? Okay. Yes. I'm, there's a, there's background noise, so I'm trying to like I'm trying to hear. Um, but yes, I'm pretty sure my vote is yes. Yes. Go. That makes it easier. I think just And Bill, do yes. Great. Thank you. Okay. Um, going on to do business. Next up, we have the superintendent evaluation. So uh, every uh, school committee member was received a survey uh, a few weeks ago, and we received responses from 80%, 20 and 24 members. Um, Lindsay and I reviewed all the responses, looked at all the ratings, read all the comments, and have uh, put together an evaluation which summary which you have in your packet. Uh, Lindsay is going to go through it. We're going to propose a rating and then we will all vote on that. Are you putting your work in? Yeah, that's okay. Uh, we're working on projecting that. Um, the evaluation goes over four standards instructional leadership, management operations, family and community engagement, and professional culture. Um, I'm, Want to thank everybody who took the time to do this evaluation. This is one of the many ways that we serve the community on the school committee, and one of the ways that we give Darius evaluation so that he can reflect on what's going well and what what needs some additional work or focus. Um, overall, we landed on a um, well. I'll go through each of the sections um, for instructional leadership. This ended up being a fairly 50-50 split across most questions for either exemplary or proficient. Um, standard two with management and operations. I included the questions, was, we kind of went back and forth, but the graphs of the questions I think sometimes give you a better representation of how things shifted on each of the um, on each of the, the standards. And I think it'll be a little more obvious in the next um, section, but uh, it's very clear that management and operations is your strength, Darius. Um, this is, you have uh, an exemplary rating of 80% across the board with that. This is pretty uh, consistent with what things look like uh, from last year. There are some more exemplaries. Uh, ratings than there were last year. If we go on to standard three, family and community engagement, uh, this is where we started to see a shift towards more proficient ratings and some needs improvement. Um, and professional culture is back to mostly a 50-50 split in terms of exemplary and proficient with, again, some needs improvement in there. I think there was, uh, in family and community engagement, there were also some folks who felt like 
they weren't able to give a rating, uh, whether it was because they weren't involved in all of the community communications or um, because they don't have kids within the school system, so their perception of community involvement and engagement is different. I think that that's one thing that is difficult for the school committee because we have this role, but we aren't in the building every day, that kind of bridging that gap with what we know goes on and how we can evaluate them seems to be a space that some folks made comments about not having enough information. I feel like I remember that from the first time I did this evaluation too. So I think that's kind of a common issue that pops up. Um, overall, we landed on a rating of um, proficient while recognizing that last year's rating was also proficient. We did see some trends moving towards growth, the overwhelming area for uh, improvement. And I, you know, I think that this may have come to light earlier today is in family engagement. So that's for all we happy with the job that you're doing, happy with the partnership that we have with you, we'll certainly support staff over there. Uh, <laughs> also the business and management side of things and hopefully we can all work together to improve. Yeah, I just uh, thank you for saying that. Yeah. Echo saying. The, to me, the rating of proficient recognizes um, overall very happy um, with Darius's work while recognizing that as with almost everything, there is some room for growth. If there are no questions or comments, um, we will roll by committee. Yeah, I like to comment. I mean, I, I know it can be able to I think the challenges with the region, regional system we have is significant. You have five school committees. I respect the fact that there is Amnesty, but that has been such a great job with Category 1 and 2. Category 3 and 4 are harder to manage with all those different buildings that aren't side to side. I understand that, but that's, you know, I, I respect it's hard, it's challenging to do all that. I just want to be known about it. You know, we're one of six or seven regional schools in the state, and uh, there's not a lot of roadmaps on how to do the well. And I appreciate uh, what the administration is doing. It's also a challenge to have five principals to work too, and very different towns, very different. Needs and goals. So I appreciate that, but it's a challenge. I don't know if anyone can get um, experts in categories I just wanted uh, to reflect on perception from town government working with this school district in Darius. Um, you know, I've been around for a little bit of time and work with different administrations. Uh, Darius and his team, Shelly, and everyone here. Um, it's, it's, it's such a strength to work with our town administrators, our select boards through COVID, through everything that we've dealt with in the last few years. Um, the strength of Darius and his team and his communication to us um, and all the capital that goes along with it. It's hard for people to understand how much he's doing constantly that it's not also focusing on the education and plans for the kids, it's also the well-being of these buildings and the capital projects. And we take on, he takes on so much more as a superintendent than uh, we see even in, in local government because it, it's, it's a big job. And, and Shelly does a ton of that work too together. Um, very strong team. Couldn't be more pleased to work with them through town government. It's our relationship with the school district. It's very grateful for your work. If there's uh, no further comment, we'll like to meet you. Roger, first. So, we have a motion for. Make a motion for Frontier. Seven. Evaluation. Uh, Olivia? Yes. 
Chris? Yes. Bob? Yep. Bill? Yep. Joe? Yes. Keith? Yes. Mary? Yes. Damien? Yes. Jared? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> uh, I move to accept the recommendations on behalf of the Deerfield School Committee. Second. Yep. Uh, I'll call the county clerk. I hear it's yes. Uh, Danny? Yes. Thank you, Mary? Yes. Yes. Thank you. 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 A second. Jessica? Yeah. Megan? Yeah. Peter? Yes. Joe? Yes. Anna? Yeah. Wait. Make a motion for, for Waitley. Okay. Okay. All right. Bob? Yes. That me. And I go. Okay. Thank you. Hey, is there anyone to comment? Well, you know, people haven't voted yet. Um, I just want to thank everyone, and it really is my team that makes it, um, it gets the work done. And you guys do. I see Shelly um, meeting after meeting, but we also have Sarah and Laura over there who both do a lot of the work behind the scenes um, regarding what happens in the classroom and the change in professional development and such. So, um, and I agree with Joe, the system evaluation isn't ideal, it's very difficult to manage. So constant feedback through emails and that kind of thing throughout the process is best for me to keep the change, keeping improving the needle. Right. Thank you. Next up, we are voting to <coughs> the 2025 transportation contract. During discussion, oh, questions. Shelly. <laughs> Yeah, if you have questions, I'm happy to answer them. Each committee has already talked about the contract at pretty extensive levels at this point. Um, for is our only bid, we do need transportation connections here, so uh, we are looking to award them. And uh, they will have to do those separately. Move for Frontier. Second. All right. Uh, yep. Olivia? Yes. Chris? Yes. Bob? Yep. Bill? Yep. Joe? Yes. Key? Yes. Mary? Yes. Dan? Yes. Jerry? Yes. Yes. And her virtual life committee as well. Uh, so for Derek Dillon, uh, I'm going to make a motion to accept the transportation bid. Go ahead. So moved. Second. Gary Angel, yes. Annie? Yes. Mary? Yes. Trevor? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, Sunderland? Move to accept the transportation bid. Second. All right. Uh, Jessica? Yes. Megan? Yes. Peter? Yes. Joe? Yes. Amanda? Yes. And Waitley. So moved. Second. All right. Bob? Yeah. Bethany? Yeah. Henry? Yeah. Okay. Um, next up, we review the professional development plan for 2024 to 2025. Pull out our magical slide. <laughs> but in the meantime, I'm Sarah Mitchell, Director of Education, the secondary focus. And I'm Laura Ramsey with a focus on um, the Director of Education and all my new focus. As soon as we get a slide, I'll tell you about all the Thank you. 
Yes. Uh, what do you want to do? I want to go to the next slide, Joe. I want to talk a little bit first about how the professional development calendar gets developed. Uh, we have a number of different data sources, um, including our curriculum review cycle. So we're on a cycle of which curriculum we're focusing on and which curriculum we're reviewing each year. We look at our performance data to see if we need some content um, professional development in a particular area or a sub area. We also use um, state and federal requirements or uh, new state and federal requirements, such as the Student Opportunity Act. We have requirements under Title I. Um, and so we review those, and anything that is due that comes down um, to Jesse or the federal government, uh, we provide a meeting on that. We also use our external audits. Um, as any of you remember, we had an equity audit last year. We also, uh, Laura and I just completed the tiered focus monitoring, which looks at our federal grants. And so we're looking at professional development opportunities uh, through those as well. Another tiered focus um, monitoring that we had this year as a district was our English as a second language program. Um, it was, it comes around every six years that that program gets reviewed. So with feedback from that office, essentially an audit, we have some professional development um, plan for next year as a response to those findings. Um, we use feedback from stakeholders, which include faculty, staff, administrators, and community, and students feed on their assumptions. It's um, directly asked or sometimes it's applied to the student board for them or it was going for on um, behalf of my parents. Um, we'll try to point out where those places are. Sometimes there's new research that emerges that um, influences our professional development. Most recently, you did research on reading. It's usually influential in the direction of professional development, which you'll see reflected in our playbooks. Um, the availability of funding for specialized initiatives makes a difference. So, right now, we have a new health grant, which will um, make some things possible next year because um, we sustained the head nurse and head birch, procured this grant, and um, we can use it in ways that will. And sometimes there's just unique opportunities that Hitchcock said during this past year was one where they said we'd like to work with all of the three teachers and teach them how to um, do hands on education around just taking care of the watershed. So we'll say yes sometimes and add that to our chapter. So just a little bit of a review of what we did this past year. Um, we're very aligned, elementary and elementary. Um, there are some projects that are unique to Frontier and some projects that are unique to elementary just based on the grade levels and the curriculum. Uh, we're continuing our work with culturally sustaining educational practices. Um, this past year, we had the opportunity to have a couple of workshops on microaggressions that came directly from our equity audit. We were able to get Translate Gender in here. Um, they did an excellent job with um, some of those workshops. Um, artificial intelligence, it is here, it is here, and we're grappling with what does that mean in the classrooms, what does that mean for educators, what does that mean for students and, and education as a whole. Um, we had a couple of workshops on that. Um, always, always looking at special education and what we can do to kind of improve our practices and universal design for learning um, is kind of a broad strokes way of addressing needs in the classroom that aren't specifically for students on IEP, but address everyone in the classroom and they benefit students um, at all ability levels. Um, we have a brand new IEP process uh, this year. There are new forms put out by the state and that's how um, sometimes our new regulations are impacting our professional development. So we're doing um, a total of four or five this spring about this new process. It's really a much more student-centered pro uh, uh, process and really focusing on student goals um, and highlighting students' voices a lot more than um, it was in the past. Restorative practices, we're continuing on with that this year. MindCap, um, it is something that was put up by the state a few years ago, and that's also a very highly individualized process for students. And so we're trying to roll a lot of what we're doing into the MindCap portfolio. So as students in grades seven through 12, are collecting items such as an English essay might go into their MindCap portfolio, or else rolling in the new IEP process goal setting into the MindCap 
um, portfolio for all students, not just students that are on IEPs. So next year, um, we're going to continue to focus on um, education that helps all students. So executive functioning, we'll be doing a series of workshops on that. Um, since the pandemic, we have really noticed a decrease in students' ability um, to use executive functioning skills. And so we really want to boost our faculty's knowledge of that so that we can use universal design for learning to help students that are struggling with executive functioning kind of staying organized. Um, we're going to try to get um, somebody for the full day on trauma informed schools. And we also have a presenter that will talk a lot about um, world anxiety in schools. Again, some of these are really post pandemic phenomena that we're just seeing um, kids not being quite as resilient as they have in the past. We'll continue our sort of practices. We are looking at the use of PLCs. We'll probably do that in the spring because we're going to be adopting a new um, data platform that will allow teachers to drill down a little bit more into what's happening in the classroom, whether it be attendance, whether it be um, student performance on writing. Um, and so we're going to do so to kind of focus PLCs on those uh, And then as always, the curriculum uh, development. So at the elementary level, um, these are some of the things we've been working on. Our reason to highlight them is because it's never one and done. Well, when we started it this year, we will be continuing to nurture it next year. It will be brand new, but it will be sustained and supported time we carved out. Um, so there have been significant curriculum initiatives. This is the first year of the community about via language arts in grades K through six. And um, a new foundational skills programs such as youth body and K through two, or some of the school stuff to three, and spellography, which is foundational um, reading skills and spelling skills in four grades. It was piloted this year. Four student four teachers will be using it next year. We also um, had piloted some screeners the year before, but they were in full implementation for the first time this year the math screener and the fiddles for other literacy screener. We're really happy to have our first year with that because we can use that data to make recommendations around summer school, um, like summer learning camp, and it feels targeted and specific and um, gives us the information we need to respond on point. The sixth grade teachers elected to implement their new math curriculum on um, illustrative math this year. That was optional because we knew after um, last year they selecting huge new programs in ELA and in math. It would not be a good idea to require teachers to learn two in one year because we really want to uh, um, reduce frustration, maximize time for collaboration. The calendar is excellent, but we only have so much time. Um, but we wanted it to be possible because some of the teachers who then on the selection committee didn't want to do any more of what was they'd seen, what was coming. They just wanted to move towards it. So we said, if you can, if you want to, as long as you're willing to go through these trainings on your own time, which I did. And so, in the end, every sixth grade teacher did adopt the illustrative math and training in that year. The Bridges Math curriculum is what we selected for K through five, and next year will be the, the major year of implementing rolling out Bridges Math. But this year, um, there's two two parts to um, Bridges Math. One is called Number Corner, and it's a 20 minute math meeting that happens every day with manipulatives and exercises that build on themselves. And 80% of the teachers in the district decided that they wanted to do it. So we have had a whole new start to the bridges implementation. Um, another, let's see, 14 teachers taught bridges as their core curriculum. Again, they've been on search committee and we're excited. They didn't want to wait. And they also had training this year um, on their own time, more or less. But next year, everyone's going to have um, foundational skills training, full workshops. We also use um, the Bridges Intervention Material Program, and so all of the liaisons, and special education teachers, and math specialists are fully trained in in-person workshop on how to use the intervention kits, which will align with the core classroom kits. So we're pretty happy about all of the work that did get done on math this year, even though next year is supposed to be the big math year, there was momentum. And that's all to the um, teacher credit. Um, we reviewed our English and second language resources and curriculum this year. Um, it it dovetailed with getting feedback on the um, shared focus monitoring report. So, this year was a review for ESL and a review for health because the new standards came out in the fall of 2023. Um, 
So that's all curriculum. And on the next slide, I just wanted to note um, that we had other opportunities that came up. And um, so there was a grant from Desi. We have um, the music teachers and art teachers working um, on, a, on a grant that um, pays them to do an inventory on the, on the um, accessibility and the um, cultural responsibility that our arts and music programs um, are. The new IEP format, as Sarah mentioned, there was an inclusive hiring process training for administrators with Dr. Liza Tillerson. She has been registered for a couple of different presentations, including the full day training on identity conscious educators, but the administrators of all departments, including nursing, including um, grounds, including um, business office, participated in this. Training, which was three sessions at um, an hour and a half each, um, so that we could improve our, our hiring systems. Um, related to our equity audit, it was a problem. one. We had this great opportunity to do um, an introduction to adaptive music education. This is one of those opportunities. I have to give credit to you, thank you for bringing it to my attention, but the district decided to spend many people to attend because it was such a, a rare I right and I turned excellent feedback and people learned the same. And they want to learn from visualized what the music does. Responsive classroom, um, we have had one, and there's definitely have two more full length audits at three out of our four elementary schools where the responsive classroom consulting comes and visits 10 classrooms and then meets with the uh, instructional of our university teams at the end to say, This is what we saw happening in your school. Um, we saw students um, feeling free to take their own needs. But we also heard teachers saying, do this for me, we want to move away from that, have students doing it for themselves and knowing why and what we do for them. So the very specific feedback about what someone sees in our school community around um, centering student voices and empowering students to make choices. These two last trainings have been major undertakings by teachers uh, to be trained and um, certified and, and letters in Birmingham. It's a monthly course. There's lots of homework. Um, the school has supported that by a lot of release time and by themselves and taking the courses, but it's all going into the research on science. So, um, that's what this year has been. And then next year, um, some of these things are responses to the equity audit, some of them are responses to the um, attendance meetings we've been having, some of them are um, so the open architect's data system. Um, that's what we need to disaggregate data and have a better sense of how different subgroups in our school are um, performing or what we can do to make sure that all students have equal access to um, high performance. Um, trauma informed and trauma informed classrooms, we're working with an organization like Frank Alban, managing elementary school avoidance and other anxiety challenges. We um, are having the Lynn Lyon to come, Lynn Lyons to come next year and do a secondary and elementary presentation and a parent meeting. They actually have to spring depending on the uh, Best practices preventing, intervening, investigating, and responding to bullying and harassment. Um, this was something that the, uh, the principals have been eager to advocate for. We also got some feedback about that through the attendance meeting that was referenced earlier. And um, so it's basically based on data and stakeholder feedback. And then we'll continue with cultural system and educational practices. Um, on the left side, probably, yeah. So, uh, we are here too for EL language arts. We will continue to support teachers with individual coaching if teachers want it, and with um, using some of our early release time to uh, organize curriculum materials. The illustrative plan um, will be our second full year of implementation next year, so that will be continually supported. Bridges now, we have staggered trainings. Um, that include orientation and then um, a six hour training on how to do all the three parts of the program. But there's special trainings on assessment or special trainings on, um, on um, uh, teaching to uh, diverse students. Um, we have our first year with a new BSL curriculum next year. We are using a behavioral health grant that I, told, I mentioned previously to purchase um, science stuff and bullying supplementary curriculum for grades in nature six. We already use science stuff as our social emotional learning, but they have a standalone unit and it was a real public time to um, bring that in. 
And then the VE Health and Design Curriculum will be under review next year. The PE teachers have done a really nice job, um, and class teachers too, of uh, helping map where our second step curriculum, which is our social emotional, and where our VE curriculum match the new health standards. So I have a map of that now, and you can identify anything that's not currently being taught, and um, we will address those um, next year, and I'm currently reviewing it. I just want to put an explanation point on that this is the engine for change in our district. And so when we talk about even some folks made some statements this evening regarding they haven't heard back regarding um you know, the attendance meetings. Well that those meetings that was the first of multiple meetings where I don't know, Laura, you kind of been a spirit. Spirit of the charge. Why don't you talk a little bit about that one? Because yeah. um, you know, people are saying like we're not hearing anything, but we were done. You know, right. and, yeah. and, and, and this kind of information is flowing into what we're trying to do within our change, which is the best So yeah, I'd love to talk about it. I'm holding on to the letter, and the reason um, we haven't sent it yet is because we're not done with our research, and we haven't talked to teachers first. And sometimes it feels like we shouldn't be presenting things to um, school committee or um, I tell the teachers no, so that there's no surprises about these that you've already you asked to do. But um, we've been interested in attendance um, since I arrived at the beginning of last year because it's a pandemic across the nation. You probably read about it or heard about it. It's been a challenge to have the same kind of attendance that we had pre pandemic. And um, so we've looked at our data. We've been encouraged to do that by the Student Opportunity Act and by Title I. So when we look at our own data, and the Massachusetts data, and the country's data, we know that students of color, students with low economic status, and students with disabilities have higher rates of chronic absenteeism. And that is defined as missing 10% of school days or more, and it doesn't matter why. Even if it's, um, even if it's an excused absence because there's a doctor's note, it is considered a concern if someone's missing one out of 10 days of school. Um, it interrupts social flow, it interrupts the routines and the habits of learning, it interrupts um, the principles and academic experiences. Um, so, what we decided to do was um, have a meeting, and it was sort of like it doesn't happen too often, but let's just invite people to come and talk and say, What would you like the district to know about um, barriers to attendance that your family has experienced? And what would you like to recommend? It was a very open meeting uh, to all the elementary families and secondary families. Um, we also um, went to a CPAC and um, I attended a CPAC meeting and asked what are the attendance barriers for your population data wise if students with disabilities would have some more chronic absenteeism than non disabled students. And we went to the OPAC meeting and asked for the English language parent community what issues or barriers. And then the principals have been meeting with families and bringing back information about really particular situations so that we know when to generalize and then to not jump in when to individualize. Um, so we've been taking, it's been about six weeks and we've been reviewing and refining our program policies and thinking about multiple communication. Some things we know are bigger than what the school can do, but we have identified many things that the school can do to help, what we're excited about. Um, so we are boosting our K-8 social, emotional, and health curriculum. That's, uh, these are things that we haven't been communicated to teachers as the plan yet, but I printed it out because a lot of this PD is actually related to that, uh, those conversations. Um, we want to update our resources by purchasing the standalone unit of bullying for each grade level. And it's just about six lessons, but there's six powerful lessons that really specify, you know, what is unwanted um, attention. Because in fourth grade, it could just be unwanted attention. It doesn't have to be touching it. Um, and we are mapping our health curriculum, like I mentioned, to make sure that uh, the recently updated standards from the fall are covered, but also we're, spent, we're just paying special attention to the community and mental health standards because we know that anxiety is part of it. And we have staff training lined up for the new curriculum on ANCO. It comes with two 90 minute asynchronous modules for teachers, one to learn for teachers themselves to learn how to recognize and intervene if something unkind is happening or something problematic is happening, anything isolating is happening, and then the there's another training for teachers, which is how to use this curriculum materials. So it's two trainings, like generally about bullying and harassment, and then specifically 
how do we teach these lessons? And I'm a trainer for um, principals and program coordinators like myself. Um, so how do we support this? Um, we also had uh, somebody come from Wright to consult with a small group that's working on this kind of thing and attended to one of the issues. And so in the elementary schools, starting with Deerfield and then if it works expanding, there's something called um, the, the five fingers system. And so at the beginning of the school year, students will get a picture of a hand and they put five adults that they trust and can use resources on each finger and give it to their teacher. And for students that don't have a network of five adults, that can be there for them or be resources, a staff are being assigned to those students so that they all have a slight student in mind, like you even point of contacting you in person to connect with you because your support system is a little bit looser than others. Um, we're providing trainings that reliance is an expert on anxiety and um, how avoidance feeds anxiety. So we know that we know from other meetings, the meeting that was referred to. Um, Earlier tonight was one meeting, but we have other groups that anxiety is a barrier. We also know that bullying and harassment is a barrier um, to attendance. Um, and so we're providing new trainings for educators on effective responses to harassment and bullying, but also anxiety and avoidance that sometimes comes with it. We also learned that for um, families who are um, Lower income uh, have mentioned themselves. This isn't from like a big survey, but that if they have one car or one parent and three kids and somebody's sick, it's easier to keep everybody home. But it's really hard to stay home with one kid and not just have everybody there. We've also learned that the families who are um, choosing in, that transportation can be an issue. So um, there's a app for carpooling, which is under consideration. Participation would be on a voluntary basis. It's not like we would put out people's addresses, but if you wanted to know who lives near me and is willing to be called for a ride, then you have to be on this app that could be on the school website. So that would be one way to make sure nobody got stuck or stranded. If you actually did want to take care of one kid and not three kids, you could get the other two in the car with somebody set up for school. Um, we also learned from the large meeting, the open meeting, that there is we, we could do more to communicate um, the difference between an excused absence and an unexcused absence. So um, our schools ask for doctor's notes when a student is out for medical reasons, for physical or mental. That's so that we can track why are we not having kids in school, and so that we can track their care, whether there's a transition back into school from being sick or unwell. Um, at the secondary level, um, absences that do not have an excuse from a doctor um, are considered unexcused and excessive absences can promote um, credit loss and that's our policy but it's important to know that there's a petition process available to all students that almost always leads to credit restitution it's just an important thing to bring someone in for the conversation to talk about we've had a lot of absences that are not documented as being medically necessary we should be in a conversation and make a plan with you about what's going on and how are you keeping up the school if you miss this flash school um, what do you need is basically the bottom line question. Um, but when the state assesses our district in regard to chronic absenteeism, which is that 10% rule, they don't care if it's excused or unexcused. We care. We care if somebody is um, mis missing an action. We don't know why. We don't know if they're getting support they need. We don't know how to help. If there's doctors, we have an understanding that they're hospitalized for the time being. Then we can work on a tutor system. We can work on a, um, somebody to communicate with them. But the state doesn't care about the difference. They just want to know, are you managing to get most of your students to school at least, you know, most of the time? So they will, um, I don't know, take the school. We have an accountability rating, and 5% of it comes from our attendance. And more than 90% of our students are chronically absent, and it lowers our, our district as a rating. And that's a big deal. 5% isn't such a big percent, but we don't want to, we don't want kids to the school anyway. But we also don't want people leaving the district or not moving here because I'm just hungry. Um, so we have used a standardized letter to caregivers when a child's absent account it reaches 10% so that families know. But through that, through some of our meetings, we learned that the letters lack empathy and support that were pretty like you're missing it and you're thinking you know, about this isn't the well, actually the letters both elementary and secondary that didn't feel good to get. We understand that it doesn't feel good to get it. That's not the intent. The intent was to be clear that it's an issue of one of support, but it wasn't coming through that way. 
So the letters have been revived to, to emphasize opportunities for partnership between school and parents in addressing the issues. And um, when a child's absences are largely medical and clearly documented, families will be in close contact with the school and the letter needs to be sent. It's not like you have a child who's hospitalized and then you get a letter about a child that's attended. We're going to be really careful not to do that to anybody. Um, but the bottom line is, is we want to keep talking to families individually about what barriers are because most of the time it's something we can help with. If it's an individual situation, sometimes they just need to know the care that it makes a difference. If the child doesn't come to school, we hope that with a strong alliance, we can identify obstacles together and get resolutions. And um, we're not sure what, what more meetings we will have besides individual meetings, but I would like to say that. Um, Anyone is welcome to reach out to me. I like being the one person for this. So you can reach out to me if you want support with a specific attendance issue or your children's principles are all that available. But just make a contact and see if you can get help. But um, it's true, we have not advertised that there's been a response to the attendance conversation. It's just that we haven't told teachers about the five finger exercise yet, for example. Um, it's coming last week, so we're not going to do it this week. They can wait, um, in our opinion, to to talk teachers about these things, but um, next year we'll be a little bit different with some of the things that we are going to get in place. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, can I just ask a couple of questions? So one, um, one quick question about communication. Sometimes I know that this happens uh, to me frequently, and I use words or will order things that people aren't familiar with. And so to kind of take a step back and kind of reflect, this isn't getting through. Let me see if I can just tell you what's happening next. Can I do that? Just no, me. no. I mean, I think that sometimes if you have, give us your input, that it might be helpful to just say, thank you so much. There's more steps in the process. Yeah. And here's when you might anticipate yeah. Yeah. a response that that might be enough of a communication. Yeah. It may not have, yeah. sometimes we kind of get lost and we know that there's all these steps. Yes. And I just need to know that I was heard and that, Here's when I can expect yes. a summary of the yes. of the community. The night that we had the meeting um, about attendance, we actually said um, we're not planning to get back to you. Were you there? No, I wasn't. Oh, there. I, I, I yeah, don't remember what I had, but I had some other. It was funny because I really thought like we're going to go to so many places and we're not taking attendance. We don't know your name. These are anonymous places to write so that you can say whatever you want to say. And we said we're not planning on circling back to you. We're putting this in the hopper. But then people talk to people about what was said at the meeting, and then people who weren't there, who didn't know that we said, we're not getting back to you, who said, how come we haven't heard anything about the meeting? So now we know. <laughs> <laughs> you have to respond yeah. even if you say we're not totally. Going to yeah, right? Like, I heard you. Thanks for coming out, giving yeah. us an opinion. Yeah, yeah. We expect to review this right. stuff and yeah. I to get back with everybody with a plan yeah. Um, yeah. by the end of the summer. Yeah, well, that was definitely something I remember. Yeah. yeah. But then we will take attendance. I didn't want people to feel, you know, put on the spot because it's kind of private what people were saying. Well, I think, private. and I don't know that necessarily attendance so much as well, like just like, hey, every, like, I think probably what is it is that yeah. we hear you and yeah. Yeah. we're working on some things yeah. and we're taking all this stuff in. Yeah. I think that that probably yeah. would have at least just been It sounds like. You guys there's are things that came up that we're not addressing, like um, COVID was a big topic, and I didn't say anything. I, you know, really, I haven't said anything about COVID. Also, family vacations was a topic. Um, there's a different relationship between students and families since the pandemic. I think that um, I, we're not vacation shaming, but we're hoping that if we work on attendance, other people will work on attendance. Well, yeah, wait, so you can also yes. say something to the effect of, while all the things that you brought up were important, yeah. you don't have the capability yeah. to address every single yeah. thing. So if you do yeah. feel that need more attention, reach out. You know, we actually found out that some families consider um, the amount of sick days that we are on scene, like, like personal days. Like, we have three days left, as opposed to <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. We've got five more days to spend however long. <laughs> 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 uh, hi, Gore. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Very good presentation. Obviously, you both have done a lot of research, and there's a lot you're trying to do for professional development. 
appreciate and respect that. I got a couple of concerns. And, um, I don't want to micromanage, but I just need an educator for my PD is very important to me. Um, my questions are Are you making it stick with teachers? So you got a lot of different facets that are very important. And, and you got the curriculum outstanding that's important to the curriculum PLA and have good choices that I've seen it already in action. I know a lot of teachers that I know are passionate about it. Um, we have the attendance issue, we have social emotional learning, we have restored practices, we have um, responsive classrooms. I know the PD, this virtual department, from what I understand from Southern, and correct me if I'm wrong, he, he mentioned full days. I don't know many full days that our faculty and their teachers have. Well, I don't, I don't. And they have an hour, which is you know, an hour and a half, it really turns into about an hour of PD on Friday. From my understanding with PD, oftentimes, you want to apply it as soon as possible. You want to make it stick. You want to collaborate on it. You want to discuss it. You want to get in teams. You want to really rip it apart and, and move it into place. Um, I know that's going on with the curriculum. I'm more concerned about some of the um, best practices um, with the teachers, specifically from Sunderland. Um, but from my understanding, you know, I've been with school for many years, but I've made connections with some of the other schools in depth of the frontier. You know, how are we making it stick? Is is this going into practice the next week? And I know you said you don't want one and done, and I appreciate that. You're going to do something to do this year, you're going to come back next year. But are we doing one thing on, you know, March 15th, and then something new on March 22nd, and then something new on March 29th? And is there, do you have that continuity of training and, and significant training? I know other districts where they have more. Days, full days. We have, if you had, we have more professional development than any other district, but it's an hour for 13 times, 13 times. Mm -hmm. I know it gets rhetorical enough, I start to answer it for you right now, but I know some of it's financial, I know some of it's contractual, um, but that's that's my concern. Is it sticking with the teachers? Some of it is. Is it sticking with enough? So I'll speak a little bit to this and then Laura jump in. Um, so that's one of the reasons we're really grateful for the PD Fridays because what we found in the past before we had PD Fridays is we would have five half days and two full days. And there was so much time, it speaks exactly to your point, there was so much time between the time you had the workshop, the time you had the next workshop for the opportunity to talk about it, that it just it, it laid there and some people picked it up and ran with it and other people you know, fell by the wayside. But by having the PD Friday, so an example is um, the executive functioning workshop that we're looking at with Sarah Ward. We had one teaser last year that was a half day PD, it was very well received. We had actually two half day PDs, very well received. And we're looking next year at a model where we do an hour 15 PD. The next week is implementation and discussion amongst departments about how to implement the classroom. And then revisit for another PD day so that you get. Three, six total sessions, three of them are workshops, three of them are really implementation. We did that with restorative practices last year with the middle school. We actually had seven restorative practice um, PE throughout the year, followed by the groups, the teams getting together to be able to implement it, because that's exactly what happens with PD. If you have something that's presented, it sounds like a great idea, and then when you put it in practice. And so that's the beauty of those Fridays. I know you're doing something similar with it. Yeah, yeah, it is working well to stitch things together. Like, um, and I think you're not. Your question wasn't so much about the academic training. Right? You know, we're thinking about the um, social emotional learning and the yeah. yeah. I, I get it. You get it. You get it. You know, I'm sorry, but, but I, I hear you. But some of the things you got six days, but I don't think all your topics get that much attention. You have some that are one. Yeah. You know, and that's my concern. Is I agree that that is good information. The curriculum great information and. Consistency and follow through. I just think you got a lot in the plate, and I don't think the teachers can hear them. I think that they probably, I think you're probably right in that having too many headlines is mind boggling. But when you look at what's driving the culturally responsive teaching and the trauma informed work and response to the work and the and the bullying, it's actually all the same. Like a lot of the content is the same. And it, and it works like it's not this and this, right. it's 
all kids need a network of support for social emotional anxiety behavior issues right now. So how do we create the communities? How do we create the procedures? How do we create the background knowledge of ourselves to recognize what's going on? How to practice saying what we need to say? And so even though there's a lot of headlines, which does not look reassuring on our calendar, I do believe that um, the things driving this are coming from one place, which is closing down pain, especially, and also um, more than that. I mean, human pain, but um, I, I really do think that there is integrity for parents, even though it has different headlines. And that when we think about the like, equity practice, it's also a trauma practice because including all the voices and having a curriculum that represents everybody in the room reduces trauma for people who have been marginalized over and over again. So there's a way in which, um, even though one workshop is one thing and one's another, it, it really does work together to teach all kids what that well as possible. Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah. Do that. Yeah. Take the one headline and tell the back to staff, yeah. this is our topic for the year. Yeah. These are all subcategories. Yeah, Our topic right, yeah. is well-being of the students and best practices. All of these others are part of that. I think that that's, that's all you need to do. That's a good idea. Thank you. Yeah, and then that helps the people that were here earlier say, well, we are doing all these. It's all these subcategories. Yeah. Money yeah. I understand it together. All right. Okay. 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 <laughs> so I just want to read, uh, more Stuart Joe said that uh, I know this takes a ton of work to get everything together, and I absolutely appreciate all the work and the great job you guys do. Um, and I noticed that the elementary school had some bullying and harassment in the second set things, which I think are great. And then I don't know, and I, I know this was all planned before this meeting, but after hearing um, some of the comments from a lot of the parents at Frontier, I just, you know, I didn't know how that story it is or were able to, I don't know, uh, make some adjustments to get in some, you know, how Title IX and uh, that Miss Lewis, I don't remember the first name, I'm sorry, um, brought up about um, do the teachers know what to do and the rubric for that and just making that, um, making sure everyone's aware of that. Um, that seems to be a common thread. Um, I can't find it from a week, that's where everyone was sitting, but um, um, about that um, and just, um, you know, is there a way that we might be able to some of that as, yeah. as well? And some of that message or, you know, some of that is to be determined as far as the professional development and how that feeds in this practically around Title IX. All of us as administrators have had Title IX training, so we're very aware of that. Um, teachers technically have Title IX training on the first day. We do it as part of the policy and all of the pieces, but clearly we want to do more than just the first day, especially. Uh, given some of the public comments. Yeah. Um, student base, um, we're very much in line with what the elementaries are doing. We're fortunate up here to have health classes and four years of health that's required. And so a lot of what we can do and are able to do, we're able to do through those health classes pretty seamlessly. Um, the health teachers are already improvising on the curriculum. So some of that can happen in those places. Uh, but I do hear you about you know, making sure that we have messages that kind of broadcast to the entire faculty. And when someone mentioned about Karen Karen, you know. Oh, okay. yeah. And there is on the website, there's a title on oh, the website. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I you speak up, Pete, so we have a hear you. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> a couple questions on the open architecture for data lack. So one would be is uh, that is something that the district has purchased? Um, is it expanding our IT budget? Is it replacing something else? So, and the third question yeah. would be what does the training entail for teachers and what are we expect to do? Yeah, excellent, excellent question. Uh, so the open architecture, we heard loud and clear from the equity audit that we needed some kind of system in order to be able to analyze their data. Because we really have, have our school, that's all great. Um, and when I have a question that I need to answer, Laura has a question, Darius has a question, we can get a spreadsheet easy peasy. 
but interpreting a spreadsheet is not what I need if I'm trying to make a decision about something. So we clearly needed something with graphics. When we talked to um, the folks that did the equity audit, they had recommended a platform called Tableau. Fortunately, we had some investor funding and we were able to be just bought just like the minimum minimum so we could play around with it a little bit. We played around with Tableau, we played around with Clipper Studio, which is also the Google version. And we actually took our attendance and sliced and diced it every way imaginable with both of those programs. What we found was Tableau was resource heavy. So we had an individual um, in IT that was really working with that product and an outside consultant working with her. And at the end of the day, we had a couple of platforms, which were great, but heavy, intense training and lots of work. Um, along came open architecture. Because we didn't have a Tableau experience, we were able to really look at that product. And they basically said, well, we're going to do all that work for you. You just need to clean up this database and that database and get it to us. And we said, that's what we need. And so we're choosing to spend our resources there. Um, it's about $10,000, I think. And so we're going to essentially use ESSER for this next year. And then we're going to have to look at our IT budget, our curriculum budget, to see where we can kind of pull together. We have one year to kind of play around with it and see is it really going to meet our needs. As far as teacher training on it, um, what our hope is, first of all, it's supposed to be so user friendly. And after clicking around, if I can use it and get my questions answered, I'm pretty confident our doctor will be good with it. Um, so it's a lot of drop down poll mounts. And what we've been doing is having many data meetings with, uh, for example, uh, middle school math came in and we made lists. So what are you currently using with data? What do you need for data? And are you open to doing some PLCs for data? And we've gotten through about three quarters of those meetings with each little mini department of the school and lots of different ideas about what they want to see. Um, and so the training itself will come once we get that open architecture in place. We can see how easy it is to use. And then my hope, my hope is that we have it up and running by the first half of the year. So that in spring we can do a February PD training on hey, here's how you use it, go, go by departments and play around with it, see what you're seeing and see what more you want to see so that we can get additional platforms. So we really kind of put some things in teachers' hands. In the second part of this question was the IT support. We did shift. We have a, a person who, um, who works with teachers for IT support. And we shifted a percent of our job away from that because there is less demand from teachers. They know how to use smart boards, they know how to use the basic software. And so only when they're onboarding new software do they really need support. Um, we kind of made the determination that the need is higher under getting this data because data we have some data driven decisions is uh, more of a priority right now. So we shifted that person. So we didn't, didn't increase, we just shifted goals. I'm, this was really interesting, and I really appreciate this. My question is the extent to which the conversation in universal design gets generalized to other aspects that you're that you're doing professional development in the curriculum. Uh, to 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 better or introduce to um, parts of curriculum like the the math curriculum. Um, um, because when you, you laid out, uh, I mean, I'm speaking as a, as a parent of a special ed student, um, you laid out some of those things. I looked at them and I was like, oh, oh, that's the thing that my son has had trouble getting access to in school. And I'm wondering whether there is a conversation around universal design with any new aspect of the curriculum being had. Absolutely. When we, um, it was a team of about 14 teachers from all four schools and different grade levels, including special education teachers, and specialists who chose each of the two curriculums, different teams, but they, we did professional development first before we looked at materials so that we would have a vision and know what we were looking for. And one of the criteria that we named was is uh, differentiation is built in, student choices are built in, and options for teachers. Like it's not a one size, neither program is a one size fits all. So I could tell you, you know, everybody wants to hear about exactly how they get uh, with our program um, promotes. Um, Universal design. It's, it's baked into their its DNA and same with the Bridges Math program and the illustrative program. And then I think that 
Um, Sarah will be doing more focus work on UVL, but I have heard that some of the elementary principals want to do it too. It goes under the heading teach all students well. But um, um, we have some, we, uh, recently been in conversations about how to make sure that our music are universally designed. And so um, and next year when our funding books Fridays are frequently ELA and, and math, the art and the music of teachers may be able to just do the L work. So we could just keep moving the pocket of our time and focus on it, but we want it to be in every perfect area of academic, arts based, social. Yeah. I just wanted to thank you for your knowledge and passion, and I feel like the, the district's in a good place with you both, you know, looking at this stuff and steering us and, you know, steering the staff towards, you know, better learning for the kids in the district. So, an eye on, uh, an eye on AI. I feel like that's going to be a huge. <laughs> So I have a couple of questions. One is, uh, Laura, I think when I hear you talk about how to how the elementary school is addressing bullying and harassment, it sounds like there's kind of a, a good, clear idea about how to evaluate the, the kids and provide the teachers with resources to how to address that. And I don't know that I have like a good idea about that at the secondary level. Uh, that doesn't feel like it's been clear, and it seems like that's an issue that really needs to get addressed both for the students, the community, and for the, the teachers. So, yeah, so we've, we've shifted some of the years, and it is clearly something we are constantly revisiting and we'll revisit again. Uh, we shifted from a number of different programs through the years. We're looking at stuff in the second step again for potential phase your way implementation. But again, it's mostly through those, that health curriculum that we're doing a lot of this work around relationships, around bullying, around the anti-bullying, um, and also we're, we'll be looking at it for you know, addition to our PD. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I guess I'm concerned that maybe leaving if it's just in the health curriculum, curriculum, the general community at a loss for how to address those issues as it comes up. Yeah, and I hear you. Um, I hear you. Yeah. So, I, I mean, at the very least, it seems like it would be helpful to have a template of talking points and resources for staff. And uh, yeah, I also think we need to look at our SAL curriculum in general. So, I, I see them as very closely tied, and some of our PD efforts are kind of aimed towards that, like the trauma informed classroom and some of those topics. But I do hear you. And the microaggression uh, is an easy time. Yeah. as well to really make sure that there's a, not just a clear idea of how to identify but how to identify and how to respond right um, right and those workshops were very focused on that translate gender i'm not sure if you're familiar with them but they do an excellent job um, very well received by staff so we will continue to do that as well uh, but i do hear you i think we need to look at it again and see what our system is doing um sometimes it feels like um, we do some different workshops here and there, and we just have to make sure it's all tied together. Well, and I want to say too that um, the reason why the elementary has so much on um, about this already is because of the things that came previously. It's not a response to a particular incident. And this is like it's been we've been working on behavior and interventions and support and relationships with the kids, you know, for a while. So it got. We got funneled into the planning plan earlier. I think and that's ideal, right? Is to not be respond to anything. It's to be building that as a culture and a community. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think that the people who spoke tonight are calling for not only a general response, but also a specific response. And so that is something that still works. But again, that communication piece you talked about, um, we are all trying to get here. So I guess that's my follow-up question is to is whether or not there is professional development happening at the administration level for communication, how to address bullying and harassment, and how to address kind of crisis management and communication in response to any given event. Yes, um, we just recently did hire a consultant to work with us, um, and that in these things they they. Um, and listening to what's happening, you know, and we're learning 
as well at the same time. You know, um, it, we don't haven't had this type of. Uh, I'd be very careful because I'm working with attorneys and stuff. But we're working on it, and this kind of and we'll be putting together um, how to communicate. And we're working with the, the consultant to help us on that. And, and maybe a little bit of, uh, of reflection at some point, probably not now, to say what can we have in place so that even it, more so, so, so the that consultant was going to continue on to help us update procedure and handbooks to be more user. While our handbooks are um, is already reviewed them are legally sound, they're not user friendly sound. And so, which happens in most public schools, um, this person also works in private school sectors, um, and working on trying to do that as well. But getting the cart before we even got yeah, there. Yeah, no, 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 I, I get that. I just think that that's an important kind of wrap up at some point to say, let's review how we can have systems in place so that when a kid is bullied, when a kid is harassed, when someone brings a teacher concerns, what are the tools that we can have in place so that there's not a moment where we go, I'm not sure what to do in this situation right now. Um, and then, no, just with the consultant, I don't need to tell us which consultant you have, but I mean, this is, this is happening in other places, you know, I mean, in some places have, have been through it and have figured it out. They're not perfect. But are we reaching out to other superintendents or other school districts who may have gone through similar problems or situations and have perhaps bullying ideas, anti-bullying, anti-bullying ideas um, in place that we could borrow? We don't need to reinvent the wheel because from an instant we can borrow a lot from them. And we look at the MASC uh, or other districts that's what this, this consultant is amazing. Um, Who are they? Is it? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, we have to find out. I know. I mean, I imagine we can, but I'm, okay. if we're so early in our relationship. Okay. I'll, we'll, I'll get all this information. Okay. But in addition to the fact that um, these number have not many schools were made there, that I love to be able to resolve all these. He was counseling us that to do the work together would help paralyze. The things because we don't want to just take one from a school that was to really great job right. because then we might not know it like that right hand and we might not go through the yeah, process. Yeah, but it's like history, it's like studying history. You want multiple primary sources to do your research. You mm -hmm. then you do, you take the pieces that work for your but you don't be in the wheel step one. That's right. Okay. Um yeah, I just, I guess, I guess I just, I echo Missy because I do, I, I really appreciate that there's all of this PD for teachers on so many different levels to support, you know, our kids. But, you know, I, I think it's so important to leave room for administrators to participate in some sort of PD, particularly around bullying harassment. And I guess a question I have, Darius, is, is this sort of work that you're doing with a consultant, is it? all administrators across the school district or is it just frontier um it's going to be expanded because it's going to be a district-wide um right now is written just with frontier okay but the plan is to expand that it'll be seen based on you know it's working with frontier because that's where the need immediate need is um in the sense of um the intervention that needs to kind of happen at frontier um and as when we talk about going into handbooks and whatnot, there's professional development within that would be affecting all schools. Yeah, and I think that that's important because kids start to learn about these things at a young age. It doesn't just automatically suddenly start when they're in seventh, eighth, or ninth grade. So I think that the more cohesive to the extent that we can be with administrators being on the same page and following similar systems, like Misty said, is it seems pretty essential from my perspective to be a little less compartmentalizing about things and a little more broad based because our kids are going through these schools like they're moving from one system to the other and we're hoping that there's some sort of commonalities there with administrators. I don't think there was any ever thought on compartmentalizing. There just is um, 
a demand in one section in one building right now that yeah. requires acute assistance. And once that is, I mean, yep, well, well, you can do short term things, and then you also have, you know, timelines are, um, I guess I'm going to say they're, they're fluid in the sense of people are going to want things earlier than later, and why, and, and, and I can't share details as why timelines are they are. Um, and I also, we don't have a plan um, that is concrete because we've been fortunate not to have this problem over and over again. So, um, doesn't mean things aren't happening, and we're trying to say that. And don't read into anything I'm saying. But, but um, working with this consultant, the idea is um, to first handle our immediate need and then look at building structures. You, you learn from, you have incidences that affect your community, and you take steps um, to learn from them and build from them and make corrections, so things like that again. And, um, you know, I, I hope there is some. And obviously, you heard tonight there isn't trust in that. But we went through a whole equity movement in this district, where there was change, there was communication, there were people that were upset about how things were handled, and we made the momentum change. Administration listened, and things were done. And if you went to the first week of that versus the last week of that, it's two different groups of people, and it's the same people in the room. And so I just want to put that out there that. Um, I think within this, there wasn't um, it wasn't a gentle nudge. It was what we saw this evening. Um, there wasn't, um, at least to me, you know. Um, and so, I, you know, I think we have to, as community members, as leadership in the community, have to understand that that making these kind of things, there's a lot of factors involved. Some are legal. Some are dealing with student rights. Um, some are, you know, how do you unroll? Without just being knee jerk and have sustainable, you know, things coming. And we're trying to work through all that while also in the busiest stretch of the school year. So um, I'm just, I'm just kind of like, you know, those are some kind of factors. I will be giving a report to the school committee what's going on, and we're working on a report to the community. If I had another two weeks, um, that would have been ideal um, from the concerns from the community versus the point we are now. Would have been a much better place, right? I'm over here tonight, but it's not a time. You know, I can't, you know, timing of things are timing of things. And I guess on a positive note, a lot of people get their voice out tonight. Um, and that's good for us to hear. You know? um, and good enough that, you know, we'll be held accountable for um, what goes on. So, that all being said, there's more to come. And, and I'm not, you know, I, I said there was more to come when we did the other work. I, I don't think I've ever said there's more to come and then nothing ever came. So, I hope that there's some faith that, you know, I've been you know, in this position in the district for 17 years, and some of my colleagues even longer, um, you know, this is our home and we want to make it right too. So, um, yeah. that's right. Okay. Right. I'm going to just say, um, separate from that, actually, um, we're pulling this all apart and looking at. Um, not just not just the schools, but the administrators, the teachers, and how you react, but also pulling from community and parents, because um, we can't deny the overarching differences in technology. So there's a lot of bullying, there's a lot of cyber bullying, and a lot of my experience has shown it happens at 10 o'clock at night, and it's built into school the next day. So you know, it's, it's really is a whole community. A lot of parts and pieces to be taken into consideration. Okay. Yeah. I would just like to, I know we were kind of focused on some really negative things that have gone on and I'm not trying to move away from that, but I do also, just looking to the future, want to compliment, especially the elementary level. Um, we came to our meeting early in the school year and explained some of the initiatives. And as a parent, I think the proof is in the pudding. Um, and I'll just share my daughter is in fifth grade and came home um, and wanted to go to the store and buy some papayas. And I'm like, why are we going to the store to buy papayas? And she said, well, I'm reading this book, Esmeralda Rising. And one of my friends shared with me that in her culture, papaya is a big part of what they eat. And so she wanted to go and like, Try a papaya. And so we did that. And I feel like 
there's going to be the history of what happened, but we're already starting to move towards the future of providing our kids a look into other people who they're with and an avenue to learn about each other and about our differences and our cultures and everything like that. And it does start really early. And so I have to applaud the curriculum that you're putting in because hopefully by the time our elementary school kids right now get to Frontier, they'll have a better understanding of each other and we'll be able to forefront a lot of these issues that are being called to action right now. Um, so I think it's easy to focus on what's bad in the moment, but I do think that just in my short time on the school committee, but also having had a child go through, um, there's some real positive changes that we're already having in place. And so I just wanted to mention that. That's such a great story. Thank you, Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. I I just want to follow up. I'm, I'm not sure what about your comment. Maybe <laughs> but I, it made me reflect a little bit on what you said about the people in the room at the beginning of an initiative and the people in the room at the end of the initiative. And I would just kind of offer that it shouldn't matter who's in the room, that our role in leadership should be to project what the overall direction and mission of the school is. I think to say that the people in the room changed. Right. I think it's just okay. I'm sorry, but it I, came no, up. No, no, I mean, the people think... in the room were a changed group from the beginning, from the first day to the second. We didn't have a lot of changes. Not different history. people Not with different, different people. concerns. Thank but it seems Thanks for like clarifying that. Yes, yes. I, I, I was off the cuff. So, That's all right. Yes. I know you were. <clears throat> <laughs> Thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you. I know we've been here a long time, so we're trying to quickly here. I was just going to say, I know this is not our past practice, but I'm sorry if we take the temperature of the room, whether we benefit potentially from a five minute recess before we continue. We've been here for two hours. Would anyone like a chance to get up and stretch or hour? Oh, power there. All right. Okay. Thank you. Good suggestion. Um, we have a pair of uh, resolutions. Uh, the first one is regarding rural aid, and uh, if with several committees from the state support this, it will go to MAFD uh, to be approved at the state level to advocate for rural aid support in our school. That's good. Do you want to speak on that? Sure. Um, do you want the the long version of the full legislative update or the short version? <laughs> Sure. 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 Okay. Uh, so MASC is uh, starting a new rural schools committee. Uh, I'm going to be co-chairing it with Mark Thurber from Mohawk. Um, and MASC has been invested for a few years in rural schools issues, but amazingly, they haven't yet passed a resolution from the dele from delegate assembly representing the entire membership. Um, so there's a pathway, a channel to doing that, and. Um, in order to get this, the delegate committee needs to be passed by a total of five committees from two divisions. And tonight we have the work committees here, and then Mohawk is in the a different division. So all of us passed this tonight, and then Mohawk passed it. It would go to the delegate assembly of MISC in November for a vote. Um, the rural school stuff is 100% in our favor. It's yeah. not worth celebrating. Right. <laughs> I second. <laughs> yeah, good work. And not too much discussion, but thank you for all of your work. Yeah, I yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Really. And I'd like to add this resolution that was crafted by me and Martin Thurber and Jason Frazier, who has been the chair of the MASC Legislative Committee for I don't know how many years it is now the MASC President elect. Right. So this is well said. Yeah. Awesome. So we would be voting on it. As individual committees, yeah, 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 it sounds like we could. You could go as long as we're. Well, as long as we're. Okay. I'll make a motion for the resolution. I'll second for rule A. All right, this let's do everyone in the room. Favor? We're short. Hands, okay, and then uh, remote, the room call for remote. Annie? Yes. And Bill? Still okay? Yeah. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Okay, next up, um, 
there's a movement uh, in our heart for our towns to uh, consider allowing 16 to 17 year olds to vote in municipal elections. So town meetings, school committees, or the budget. Um, the resolution we're looking at tonight um, is non binding, of course. It's just showing the support of the school committee to the towns. Uh, it's for the uh, town committee. Um, yeah. Who brought it? I'm sorry, go ahead. Just gonna say, Bisky, thank you for meeting our kind of goals and responsibilities. Yeah. Started, we had that at least twice a year, if not many goals, which you think would be. Yeah. yeah. Um, and you know, like my personal support for this measure, but I don't know whether it falls with the our goals and responsibilities. So, and, and I, and I, I want to hear that. I, that's a bad one for you. I would love to respond to that. So, um, we are elected to represent the best interests of students in our district um, and for public education. And public education is really rooted in educating an electorate to engage in democracy. Um, so this is a little bit outside of the box, but I think it's appropriate for us to think creatively about how we are supporting our students in becoming major citizens. Yeah, in, in response to that, I heard from a couple of uh, teachers, I'm not sure if they gave kind of universal comments, yeah. but the teachers seem very supportive of this in terms of helping to engage the um, and I'm a yeah. <laughs> member and I'm a you know, community member. And I'm supportive as a parent, I'm supportive as a community member. I just don't know as a committee member that it was appropriate or not. We don't have to weigh in on that and say, as a committee, we should pursue this. We have, we have been elected to represent the best because of the students. This is our job to give them the most examination. We're, we're sort of like the the proxy is doing the homework for the other town meeting voters and kind of talking about us. Their best interest in school, their best interest in life. Yes, like all of it. Are you going to lower the drinking age or you voted? <laughs> I, it's a question, because right? It's just one privilege over another privilege, right? And it's real work on the well-being of students. So if we're going to do it. What about? <laughs> but if, if I'm not mistaken, this is part of the MASC legislative Kind of uh I don't know, legislative agenda but this is this is on the recommendations it came out in a newsletter that this was one of the things that masc was recommending the school committee to yeah. address it so yeah yeah i have to i, I don't know if i can find it again but i'll look for it something in case things to say yeah i'm still i'm still wrestling the same thing is it our responsibility or not. Um, I'll jump ahead a little bit. The way I see it is our students, when they are old enough to vote, 18, they probably miss the local town elections. And they go off to college, go off to jobs someplace else. You need to get more involved in local civics and local community. If you go back to the center, civics used to be part of education and how to vote and what you like. You don't have that anymore. If they can get more interested in voting now, that population could help elections in the future. And if you look at statistics, teens are one of the higher, 1890, some of the higher uh, turnouts for elections. We can start that earlier and give them the power. Maybe they, I just had a thought the other day, like maybe they talk to their grandparents. And the reason I brought that up is because on Sunday, when you go to the caucus, it's all grandparents. You know? I was in the room with the caucus. I was the youngest. I'm not young. Uh, and I was one of the youngest people. And I, I said my first talk, I said, where are young people? They don't care, they don't know. And if we can encourage that kind of momentum when they're 16 and 17, maybe they will start coming with talks. Maybe when they have their families, when they're in their 20s and 30s, they're invested in, in the town. And so I support it because of that. Um, and I, I know we can't do it here, it's micromanaging, but my hope would be if it was, and it's, it's a long thing on the way in, it's just a recommendation. We just be in a queue with some other towns that are voted in in the state. It's still up to the state um, to eventually allow it. So, uh, you know, I, I think getting it out there and being in the forefront it is important for our community. I mean, I just, I'm, as a parent, I'm in full support of this as well. I think it's a really neat idea. Uh, I'm talking to kids about it. They, uh, teenagers, they're about whatever. <laughs> um, but I am with, you know, with Jared and Joe, how you commented on, you know, where is it our place to 
recommend this or not recommend it. I, I don't know if I can answer that. I just comment on it. Uh, I, I think it would be a really cool idea. I know you couldn't make this contingent on it, but maybe just put it out there in the curriculum that prior to the age of 16, if this were to pass, that the curriculum would be in a civics class or a government class to coincide with the age 16 voting uh, age. Then the government's a senior class. Exactly. If right the class, so, they register to vote. So if this passes, maybe the curriculum, I know we can make it contingent on it, right? That is probably going to be able to do. Um, but maybe, the chair of the maybe, maybe it would be <laughs> that, that a government class could be uh, moved up to allow the younger kids to kind of think about what voting means. Have a special guest speaker. You? No, no, and have a special guest oh, speaker. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, um, Are you responding to that? No, not, uh, not really. No, I, I struggled on this one a little bit because I feel like I want to encourage younger people to get involved. Um, not enough young people get involved with government. Um, me sitting here is a classic example because I'm filling a spot we can't get filled on the Dear Coast School Committee. Uh, so I'm serving a select board and this so role. Would you rather put a 16 or 17 year old no, that's, that's my that's my struggle because I, I don't feel like they have yet at 16 or 17 grasped the cons uh the, the responsibilities of the taxes and the requirements that are that, that make up running a town and, and the things that they are voting on um you know have real life consequences for um for the employees of the town and the hr requirements of the town or there, there's a lot of things that go on in a municipal government i'm not sure they're ready for that but maybe they maybe we need to educate them to get them to that point i, I don't know just struggle a little bit i would counter with have you talked to everybody in town because i'm not sure everybody in town is aware of all the you know the taxes and all of that no sort of it's just true. not that the kids are um but this was put forth um as part of an masc um bishop thing and representative andy vargas and senator harriet chandler introduced the empower act so to oh, okay. empower municipalities to have the ability to lower their municipal voting age under local so i mean i think i mean my during COVID, I was volunteering with um, the town elections, and so I mean, like, I mean, I can't do it. And uh, and then they liked it, and they continued doing that. And that was the first thing they were excited about. And both of them, before they left for college, made sure that they told their town offices that they could get their electoral ballots sent to their colleges, and they could still vote. And I think part of that is because you know we have a, some good government classes here. But I think part of it was because they saw that they took in ballots. They were 15, 16, 17. They did it. They took in the ballots. They checked in people. They knew what was happening. And I really think that made a difference. Yeah. I mean, I, I didn't make them at first, but then they chose to do it. <laughs> um, so, and I, I just think it's if kids want to come to town meeting, yeah. I, I think they should be allowed to come to town meeting, listen, and and make some, you know, some, you know, comments or ideas. But I don't think they're going to come and they don't think they're going to Exactly. No, I think that's true. I found some MASC information that might be helpful. This is a current MASC resolution that's set to expire. The ask from MASC in the newsletter, I don't have the newsletter, but I have the current resolution, is that if, if enough committees uh, pass this, then it will continue to be a resolution. So it's already a resolution passed right. by the MASC in their wording to uh, to your point in Massachusetts, 16 year olds have been deemed able to consent to sexual intercourse, obtain a learner to permit and driver's license, get married with parental consent, work a full-time job and pay taxes, be tried as adults in a court of law. True. And the 2018 act promotes civics engagement mandated to increase emphasis on civics education in Massachusetts public schools last part and studies conducted in places where 
with a voting age of 16 have demonstrated that when partnered with a strong civics education, it sounds like we have here. Yeah. Um, and voter turnout and higher uh, results in a higher overall civic engagement and voter turnout and higher propensity to develop a lifelong voting habit. Good point. So that's what's in the current resolution. There's more to it, but I just yeah. Um, I'm sorry. I just want to say I have a 17 year old and I'd argue that she is more in tune with what's going on in our world than most voters. I also think that at that age, they have passion about it. We are catching them at a time that is pivotal for their involvement throughout their, their adulthood. And so involving them in a choice and allowing them to have a voice and, and have it be heard, and especially in our small towns where they can really have a voice be heard, um, is is a great opportunity. I full support of it. I think we should give the kids a survey and ask them. Uh, and several school. kids uh, reached out to yes. voice their support. So yeah. um, kudos to them. Yeah. So, Trevor's point, I teach. 18 to 26 year olds, so that's exactly the same impression, and they can vote. But you know what? The, the other thing is that uh, kids, they're adults. Um, the, uh, the ones who come out and are going to vote are going to be the ones that are also, right? Um, and that's what makes me, yeah, I, I'm, I'm almost. The other, the other thing to, to, to your point is that at time, we'd be voting on the people who are voting for us, which makes me feel like it's part of our. Right, that it's the same thing as voting on like the rules that we are, whatever parliamentary rules that we follow. Like that, that, that we're voting on our voters, and so that's also what makes me not know that. Is the other part about the budget? Like, did like how much? Yes, they were. Right. And it's been and it's, 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 it's a little question. And I, it's great. I have Dr. Dottero. I trust to vote accurately, but I just don't think it's my job as a school board to. They're saying this, and we we did support this at this select board to put it on the ballot. Yes. So it's not a ballot. There, there you have it. So I would clarify the background of what is actually going on. I'm not sure everybody knows. So we've got a group of frontier students who have been taking the steps to try to enact this for our four towns. Um, I've been working with them. I'm so proud of them. They're amazing. Um, so far, we've gotten citizen petitions certified in Sutherland, Jericho, and Conway. Wait, the deadline is not until May 1st, so that's how it works. The petition is adding an article to town meeting warrants uh, where if it's approved at town meetings, where the municipal body age is 16, we would have our legislative delegation file a formal petition, and the state legislature would have to approve it before we can actually let vote. There is already a queue of other communities in the state who have done that. And the legislature has for a few years now has been not taking any action. So they would like us to join that in that for those communities in Hampton, Boston, Cambridge, Brookline, Lowell, Southborough, um, and Lexington is voting later this month. Um, so the, uh, the annual town meetings is not the final step. This could be a many years prop, but we can move forward with the So just to, just to, uh, for clarity, I was under the impression it had so it had passed in like Cambridge and stuff, but but the legislature didn't take action to allow it. Right. Yet. They're looking the other way. They're not taking any action. They're not. They're also not protecting it. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. So so I spoke to the activists in those other towns, and they're really excited that we might get some rural representation that yep. an extra annual. Sure. That number. Thank you, Vice President. Um. Would anyone like to make a motion? Should we do this by um, um, considering it sounds like there might not be well I, I was I was going to do it by probably on the 38 grass. I think it's but, worded so that it's gonna be 38 and not in the motion. Well, uh, so it's yeah, a motion for the frontier and then you do it by committee because it's your committee that's yeah, it's, your committee's endorsing it, not Union 38. Yeah. So Union 38 is like Union 38's calendar, the association working with the unions. And so when you have to be together on something, everything else you're individual, you're individually, you're just doing business together at a once. Okay, so we'll let the individual please choose yeah. if they want I'll to. Do it. I think we have a motion from Olivia. Yes. 
I'll second. Right. Um, just, can I clarify? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Absolutely. So I, I understand your explanation with the mating versus. So a frontier pass, so frontier, frontier will sign the bottom. Right here order. is. Oh, good question. Is Ms. Cloudy? We're, we're, we're four towns. So Are regional we're schools not. endorsing this or is it municipal? It's, I guess it doesn't matter. But it's a resolution supporting an idea, not something that we're driving for. We have any customs. So I think that the voices of the frontier members are in that. Can I address? Maybe your, your, your thing about are we going to be educating the students before they actually vote? Um, I know that can't be a continued. You know, I, I, I just want to say, I have been very active in personally committed to making sure we have some sort of public education, not just for students who are becoming eligible, you know, might not be able to fit whatever path into their school schedule. But the kids are not the only ones who don't know about local politics at annual town meeting. I don't know if I'm going to end up doing this in collaboration with other town officials. Social studies faculty with the public libraries, but we do need more education for our entire communities. And I think it could be sort of inspired by the 16 and 17 year olds. Most, most people get their first chance to vote in November after they finish their grade of public education. Um, by doing town election, like they're in the spring when more kids have had their birthdays, so actually most of our sophomores would be eligible. We've got a motion and a second for Frontier. Any further discussion from Frontier? All right, go with Olivia. Yes. Chris? Yes. Got it. Bob? Yeah. <laughs> Memorize the list. Bill? Yep. Yes. <laughs> All right, I think I actually have to like keep that. Yeah. Mary? <laughs> no, it's okay. <laughs> David? <laughs> yes. Jerry? I'll just to throw you off. I'm saving. All right. Uh, Jared Bill next. Is like a motion? Come on. Second. Okay. Uh, Perry, yes. Annie? Yes. Jared? Trevor? 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 Yes. Yes. Megan. Yes. Peter. Yes. John. Yes. Nana. Yes. Mm -hmm. Wait. Hello. Uh, second. Okay. All right. Bob. Yeah. Bethany. And Heather. Great. Thank you, everyone. Uh, okay, so the final item, I'll be brief. Um, this came up at our committee of chairs meeting recently. Um, being a new school committee member is, there's a lot, there's a huge learning curve. There's a lot to um, just get used to, I think, a multi year learning curve. Uh, so there has been a little conversation of what is the best way to support new members. We have the uh, school committee guide, which is great. But there is just more like the logistics and what what really happens in our districts. Uh, to make this work. Uh, so uh, there's some ideas. It does that mean uh, can we take advantage of our structure where we have frontier regional and Anthony and 38, and could we have a mentorship program where new committee members are paired with an experienced member of a different committee, uh, or could we do something? Potentially, summer, early fall, all those committee members or anyone who wants to be involved come to a meeting um, in less formal than a regular school committee meeting and just kind of get, get to know each other, uh, talk to more experienced members about you know, any questions they might have, um, share ideas, that sort of thing. So, we don't necessarily make a slide. Uh, if anyone has any feedback, I'd be happy to hear that. Are you a new member by a mentor in a different committee, like a different town? I would love that. Yeah, to give you the opportunity to have questions about it. That's a great idea, and also help strengthen the different communities to it. And within my own group, I get five people that talk to them all the time. Some of them get it from the other I think that sounds, uh, the, you know, the onboarding training really great and, um, and definitely the. Um, 
November trip to the Cape. Yes. We learned a ton there, new members for sure, but I do like the idea of partnering up with, with other members. I'm happy to talk to people anytime and get them excited about serving. Yeah, I think one of the things that we that came up as we were talking is just things are a little different in the or the rural school district and the part of the region. And the, yeah. you know, there's some things that don't get covered in raw depth in the state trainings that right. pertain to us that we should really know for sure. So that's something maybe Pastor Chair said in a conversation of yeah. assigning mentors. Absolutely. I like the idea of having a retreat for some presentation and sort of informal opportunities to get to know each other. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Not required. <laughs> you know, yeah. you are interested. Yeah. Not that I want to go to any more meetings, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah.